February 2002. I'm still working at Frame Art Galleries, putting together those picture frames, and reading a lot of books. Another month of a lot of media tie-ins, with a few other things thrown in. But, we start pretty much where we left off in January of 2002, with... Star Trek The Next Generation Double Helix Book 3 Red Sector by Diane Carey. And in this one, uh, this is a big giant story about a virus that's killing aliens left and right. It takes place during the time of Star Trek The Next Generation, but jumps around from to different characters from different shows. And in this one, uh, the Romulan Empire is uh, being afflicted with this virus, and so Spock must recruit McCoy, um, who are both still alive at this point, uh, to try to save the Romulans. They have to find this um, lost Romulan heir, I think he is, uh, because he's uninfected. His blood might be the, the key to stopping this virus. Uh, so that's book three, and let's move on. Star Trek Double he Star Trek: The Next Generation, Double Helix, book four, Quarantine by John Vornholt. And this time, we've got um, another planet being affected by this virus, and some of the Marquis, I believe there it's pronounced. But this time we have Chakotay, Tuvok, Torres, and Seska. Um, I believe all of them are from, uh, is it Enterprise, or not Enterprise, um, Voyager, but this is before the events of Voyager, uh, and so, again, more characters from the TV show trying to figure out what's going on with this virus, and I don't remember at which point we discover that this is all part of somebody's plan, and so we move on. I'm just going to fly through these. Star Trek The Next Generation Double Helix Book 5, Double or Nothing by Peter David. And this one, we're back to Picard, an actual Next Generation character. And he's going to team up with the captain of the USS Excalibur, Mackenzie Calhoun. Um, as they, I think maybe now, they know who's done it, who's doing it. And they're trying to put a stop to it. And I think this is the one where there's a, a planet of a bunch of different races. And so this bad guy decides to hit this planet with the virus because now he can see how it works on all of these different races in a single location instead of how he has previously been hitting each race one at a time. But Picard and Calhoun are going to put a stop to it. Or will they? Star Trek The Next Generation Double Helix Book 6, The First Virtue, by Michael Jan Friedman and Christy Golden. This takes us back to the beginning. Why has this guy decided he wants to destroy all these people? This actually takes us back to the USS Stargazer. Previous to Picard being on the Enterprise, he's the captain of the USS Stargazer, and he has Jack Crusher. Dr. Beverly Crusher's husband is with him. And uh, we're going to learn what happened in the past that has affected what went on in these the previous five books. What happened to cause this person to go crazy and want to create a virus that's going to wipe out pretty much all life in the universe. So, uh, just a fun series. It was nice to see all of the different characters from all of the different shows uh, connected in this big, giant, epic story. But that's it. That was, that was the last four books. That was pretty quick. And then, some more media tie-ins. We have Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The Journals of Rupert Giles, Volume 1, by Nancy Holder. And this is a novelization of three episodes of Buffy, they're supposed to focus on Giles, but um, what we have is Helpless, 
which takes place on for Buffy's 18th birthday. Uh, the Watcher's Council shows up in Sunnydale and explain that there's this test that all Watchers have to go through if they make it to the age of 18, where they are stripped of their powers and then locked in a house, or in this case, Buffy's locked in a house with a psycho vampire. I don't remember if they actually tell her that she's going to be stripped of her powers, but she has to prove that she can kill a vampire, and this is a crazy vampire, uh, without her powers. And of course, Giles, uh, basically Giles rebels at this point. Spoilers. Rebels against the Watcher's Council. It's followed by a new man. It's Buffy's 19th birthday. Giles feels that he's not important to her anymore. And so he goes out drinking with an old frenemy. Um, and ends up being turned into a demon. And trying to essentially overcome prejudice. Because everybody just sees a demon. But it's really Giles. Will they recognize Giles inside the body of a demon? And then, uh, finally, we have Blood Ties, which is Buffy's 20th birthday. And this is when, this is in Season 5, we've been introduced to Buffy's younger sister, Dawn, who didn't exist in the first four seasons. We learn that she's the key. She learns that she's the key, and Glorificus, the bad guy, is after her. And I don't know how much this actually has to do with Giles, this particular episode. Um... But, I wonder, I can't remember if this is, I've talked about this before. There's one of these novelizations where it literally has stage direction in the book. Like when they were writing it, they just accidentally wrote down the stage direction if they were working off the screenplay. I don't know. Could have been this one. But Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Journals of Rupert Giles, Volume 1. Not the best of the novelizations, but if you're a Giles fan, it's okay. Then we have Cold Blue Midnight by Ed Gorman. And uh, so our main character is a woman named Jill Coffey. Six years ago, her husband, Peter, was executed because he was a serial killer. And now somebody blames Jill and is trying to destroy her life. Ed Gorman, great writer of thrillers, and this one uh, has some twists and turns. It's good stuff. Can't go wrong reading Ed Gorman. <coughs> Excuse me. Next up, The Hole, H-O-L-E, by Guy Burt. And uh, this novel was made into a movie starring... Someone I can't remember now. Wow, it was just it was just up there, and now it's gone. Um, I've never seen the movie, but this is a book I just stumbled across it at the library. It sounded interesting. And essentially, you've got these five high school students in England, and there's a sixth student who's like a big prankster, and there's a this sort of bunker on the school property that um, is run down, and the the prankster says, hey, he convinces these five students, let's pull this great prank. It'll be like a human experiment. You're going to go down into this bunker. I'm going to lock you in for three days, and then I'll let you out. And it'll be the greatest prank ever. People will be wondering what happened to you. Well, the three days come, come and go, and nobody lets them out. So what are they going to do? How are they going to escape? Are they going to even be able to survive. What's the big twist at the end? I thought this was a pretty good book. Again, I have not seen the movie. Anna Pack one? No. The other one. Um It's the it's the actress from Ghost World and American Beauty. And I can't think of I can picture her. I just can't think of her name. Um uh, I don't so I've I've heard about the movie. And I know that there's a certain twist in the movie. Just don't remember. I don't know if it's the same one as in the book. I don't remember exactly what the twist is from the book, but it's pretty interesting. You know, you've got these five high school students locked, trapped in this very confined space, 
Um, are they going to go all Lord of the Flies? Are they going to work together? What's going to happen? It's not a bad book. Apparently the author wrote it when he was 18. And I think there's a sequel. But I haven't read it. Just The Hole by Guy Burt. It's a good book. All right, now we're back to some media tie-ins. I have to turn the page. Let's see. Yeah, there's only two more books on this long list that aren't media tie-ins, but let's get started here with Star Trek New Frontier, book one, House of Cards by Peter David. This is our introduction to Captain Mackenzie Calhoun of the USS Excalibur. Um, Because I think these came out before the Double Helix series. That was my introduction. The Double Helix series was my introduction to the character, but I believe the books, the New Frontier books, actually came out first. I love Peter David as a writer. And in this, the first four books are essentially a, a serial. They're shorter, and they all tell one big story. Um, and it's the Thelonian Empire. Um, and the Thelonian Empire is in Space Sector 221G. And this they, they're, they're a, a race that rules with an iron fist, but they're falling apart. And so there's chaos in Sector 221G. The Excalibur has been sent to help in any way they can. Um, we're introduced to a whole bunch of brand new characters, but there's also some actual characters from Star Trek The Next Generation, including Commander Shelby and Robin Leffler, who was in one or two episodes, played by um, uh, Judd. Is it Ashley Judd? <laughs> um, and so we have this diverse group of characters aliens and they have to go into Thelonian space and try to help wherever they can keep essentially this whole sector from falling apart and I followed that up with Star Trek New Frontier book two Into the Void by Peter David did I say Peter David for the first book they're all by Peter David uh so in this one one of the one of the planets in the sector that had been ruled by the Thelonian Empire. They've, the government or whomever, this group of people on this planet have taken hostages and essentially tell uh, Mackenzie Calhoun that uh, they'll release the hostages if they're given Starfleet technology. Well, how is how is Calhoun going to save the hostages without giving up technology? Seems like that would be a violation of the prime directive and also we're learning a lot of back history with these characters and calhoun has a secret we don't know what it is yet Uh, a a uh, dark background then we have star trek new frontier book three the two front war by peter david (laughs) excuse me and this is just more of this big story the Thelonian Empire falling apart, Sector 221G. But um, there is a Thelonian ambassador on the Excalibur, Saquon, I think is his name. And he has sort of a secret agenda. I don't, re- it, it must be at the very least revealed in this book. I don't remember if it was revealed before, but basically he's looking for his missing sister. So while the rest of the crew, most of the crew are just trying to save the Empire, or not save the Empire, save the Sector. Saquon is is on a secret mission to find his missing sister. And then, Star Trek New Frontier Book 4, Endgame, by Peter David. And this one brings this main story to a conclusion. Uh, Calhoun and his crew are going to bring a touch of stability to Sector 221G. But this is, these four books all tell one story. Uh, It's actually available. I don't know if any of these are available like in new copies, but there is an omnibus edition of these four, first four books, because it is one big story. But I love the characters. 
I love Peter David's writing, and it's I love that for the most part anything can happen to these characters at any time. I've talked about this with some of the Star Wars stuff that I've read. You know, when you've got the main characters, it's it, it's not likely that anything really, really bad is going to happen to any of these characters. You're not going to see Kirk killed off um, or Picard killed off or whatever. Or if they are, something's going to bring them back. But when you have original characters, with a few exceptions, anything can happen to them. There's no, the, the, the authors aren't beholden to any TV shows or movies or anything else. They can do whatever they want. And Peter David, great writer. All right, so I followed this up with Legend of the Five Rings, Clan War, Seventh Scroll, The Lion by Stephen D. Sullivan. And I could find no information on this book whatsoever. But uh, Legend of the Five Rings, based on a role-playing game, um, set in a mythical feudal Japan type world where there's monsters and magic and things. Each clan has a different sort of specialty and personality. It's what you get when you have these role playing games. And uh, the clan wars telling an overarching story, but I can't tell you anything about this because I couldn't find any information. So we'll just move on to Fire on the Mountain by Edward Abbey. <laughs> this is something that might interest fans of Richard Bachman. Uh, this is the story of John Vogelin. And this book originally came out in 1962. But John Vogelin is an old man, I think in New Mexico, just trying to live his life when the government comes along and basically says, we want your land. And he's going to fight the government to keep his land. Whether that's legally or not, who can say? Uh, but the reason I mentioned Richard Bachman is, I think it's Roadwork, is essentially the same story. Um, not 100% sure, because I haven't actually read Roadwork. I haven't read The Running Man or Roadwork. I've only read the first two Bachman books. But uh, I believe that's essentially, it's a guy on a mountain... And the government wants his land, and he's going to fight them off. But that's what uh, Fire on the Mountain is here by Edward Abbey. Edward Abbey was a huge environmentalist and um, just a, a wild, crazy, controversial figure. But he wrote a lot about uh, saving the environment, fighting the government um, to save the environment and to keep them from overstepping and things. Uh, but interesting, interesting book. All right, then we have Angel Bruja by Mel Odom. It's a book that takes place, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the world of Angel, the spinoff of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's in the first season because uh, Doyle is still around. And this essentially, Angel is going to take on, I'm horrible at saying this, La Llorona. Uh, the, the weeping woman, the woman in white. Um, it's still in Los Angeles, but, you know, some horrible things were happening. People are spotting a woman in white when these horrible things happen. So, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. The, or the, um, I don't want to try and say it again, the woman in white, the story of the woman in white. Uh, it's always a fascinating story, and I like when, Things like this, you know, uh, an angel novel actually bases itself on mythology. Real real mythology, does that make sense? Um, if I'm not mistaken, the first episode of Supernatural is about the woman in white. Um, it's a popular myth. So that's Angel Bruja by Mel Odom. Then we're going to circle back around to Star Trek New Frontier Martyr. By Peter David. Now we're getting into single story books. Um, although there is a thread running through everything. Especially, it's nice when you have a single author writing the entire series. Um, 
because he can he can tell the story he wants to tell. Don't have to worry about other authors coming in and trying to uh, capture the voice of the characters and things. Um, but in this one, uh, they're on the planet Zon Zondar. That's the only note I made. Uh, but basically, we're still at the point where within Sector 221G and the former Thelonian Empire, the Excalibur is basically going from world to world where they're having troubles adjusting to the fall of the Thelonian Empire. Um, and I didn't make more notes, so I can't remember exactly what the story was. But uh, it's good. It's good. St oh, I know what it is. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the Excalibur shows up, and for some reason, a group of people on Z Zondar, Zondar think that Calhoun is a prophesied figure. He's um, the chosen one or something, and I guess it wouldn't be the chosen one, but he's, he's a prophet who has come to them. And, of course, there's an opposing factor that thinks, no, he's not. He's a false prophet or whatever, false messiah. Um, and so you have this conflict, and Calhoun and the crew of the Excalibur are just trying to, just trying to save the planet. And then the penultimate book for February 2002, Star Trek New Frontier, Fire on High by Peter David. This one focuses on Robin Leffler. And, uh, you know, each book kind of focuses on different characters, but there's always other stuff going on in the background. But basically, Robin Leffler's mom died 10 years ago, and but they've come to this planet where there's a woman, I think she's being held captive, who seems to be Robin Leffler's mom. What the heck's going on? Why is Ashley Judd's mom alive when she died 10 years ago? Um... Again, just fun Star Trek stuff. Uh, Peter David's really good at writing dramatic as well as comedic stuff in his books, and he mixes it well. And uh, I, I absolutely love this New Frontier series. But finally, the last book that I read in February of 2002 is The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. Science as a Candle in the Dark. And this is basically about, um, <laughs> if I were to paraphrase, the stupid shit that people believe and why it's dangerous for people to believe stupid shit. Um, and I, the, one of the things that stands out is he talks about how way, way, way back in the day, people were always seeing angels and the Virgin Mary and these religious sightings, and now it's, there's still, you know, some people see Jesus and a piece of toast and stuff, but now it's, it's UFOs and uh, cryptids and things that people are seeing. But uh, it's, it talks on the back about, uh, it's just casting a wide net through history and culture, Sagan examines and authoritatively debunks such celebrated fallacies as witchcraft, faith healings, demons, and UFOs. And yet, disturbingly, in today's so-called information age, pseudoscience is burgeoning with stories of alien abduction, channeling past lives, and communal hallucinations commanding growing attention and respect. Um, and this came out in 1996, is the copyright for this, and it is as relevant today as it was back when it came out. Um, definitely something that I would like to reread. Uh, I watch a, uh, a YouTuber on, well, on YouTube. <laughs> uh, his channel is Cyman Dan, and it's mainly debunking things. He's got one series called Tinfoil Tuesdays. He's got another series called Flat Earth Fridays. And he's got a lesser series that's um, debunking Facebook science, something like that. And it's 
incredible to me how many people there still are in this, the year of our Lord Cthulhu 2024, where people still believe that uh, the earth is flat, that we've never been to space. There's one guy that thinks space doesn't exist. Um, the earth is hollow. All of these crazy things. And <laughs> this really gets into that, the whys and wherefores and why it's dangerous. And again, it's amazing that even nowadays people still believe some of this stuff. Um, it's too bad Carl Sagan isn't around. Uh, I would love like an updated version of this book, but um, I think this might move up on my to be reread pile. It's been a while, 22 years. But it's a great, great book. Uh, so that is it. That is everything that I read in February of 2002. As usual, did not think of a question ahead of time, but let's just go with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, do you think that believing in things like Flat Earth and the Hollow Earth and all of these other things, is it dangerous? Uh, is it just funny? Is it, you know, should we just point and laugh at people that believe some of these crazy things or is it dangerous for people to believe this stuff if you watch Simon Dan uh, and some of these people basically he, he's debunking or talking about videos that other people have posted on YouTube and some of them um, I think I, I think I've talked about this before some of them seem to come from a a place where the person has an agenda but some of them the ones that really make me sad are the people that actually believe this actually believe these crazy things for some reason there's one guy I'm, I'm almost certain I've talked about this before but there's one guy that just thinks it's crazy that anybody believes we've been to the moon, or that the earth isn't flat. Um, and it makes me sad, because there's obviously something not quite right in his head. Um, but anyway, what do you think? Is it, <coughs> excuse me, is it dangerous, or is it just something we have to live with and it doesn't matter? Uh, I have another book about conspiracies that talks about um, the fact that believing these things is dangerous, and it's it's talks about the the lack of critical thinking, the and different aspects of it. But uh, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections, please put those in the comments below. Um, comments are open for spoilers. Just post spoiler warning. We try to be polite here on my channel. I just realized I didn't answer my own question. Yes, I think it's dangerous, uh, essentially, because some of these people have such a deep, apparently, have such a deep belief in these things for which there is no real evidence, and I think that that kind of mindset can be dangerous, especially... If these people are teaching other people, if they have kids or whatever, the, a lack of critical thinking skills leads to certain politicians being elected, certain laws being passed. It leads to certain prejudices and bigotry and all of these other things. Um, so, yes, I do think it's dangerous. So there, that's my answer to the question. Let's move on to, please like, share, and subscribe, all the usual YouTube stuff. And if you'd care to follow me on other social media, my Twitter is at Ronan5757. My Instagram, where I post pictures of books, comic books, board games, and funny animals, is ericsmith5757. That's Eric with a K, E-R-I-K-S-M-I-T-H 5757. If you're on Blue Sky, I am at E-L Smith. That is all I have for you this week. So until next week.
read more books.